Welcome to this week in Missouri Politics from a very sleepy state capital in Jefferson City. We are joined by the guy who's uh, driving folks hard, Majority <laughs> Poll Leader Caleb Brown. Thank you for joining us. Good to be here again. You know, if you add it up, you know, the governor says all state employees should make $15 an hour. I don't think you made $15 an hour this week. <laughs> I don't think we've made $15 an hour for a long time in the Missouri Senate, which, you know, that's it's what, what we're here for public service. There's a reason it's taken a little long. You've, you've put more time into the office than normal this week. You're uh, trying to redraw the congressional map, something you're charged with doing every 10 years. It's, uh, it's a pretty legitimate impasse right now. Break down for folks what the impasse is. Yeah, I mean, you, have, you just have a bunch of people who are interested in the process for a bunch of different reasons, right? That's the, 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 the crux of it. There are also obviously people who are interested in it for, for selfish reasons, and I don't necessarily mean that pejoratively. Um, you know, every politi or everybody thinks every politician has ambition, uh, and so they're, they, they're, do. they do. And so they're thinking about the next thing, and this is a chance to kind of mold what the next 10 years looks like for anybody who's, who's interested in that. And so, you know, I, I'm not sure that the 7162 thing has gotten most of the uh, attention. I'm not sure it was actually a ever actually about that. Let me break the, just ask this yeah. question. If you see this on Facebook right now, and you're just a guy that's a Republican who pays, may not even know there's eight congressmen and women. Why is it, oh yeah, okay, get an extra Republican. Mm -hmm. Break down the argument for what the, the map that was produced by the House, the map you endorsed, Break down the argument for what they call a 6-2 map that you support. Yeah, so 7-1, uh, in the best of circumstances, is a 7-1. It comes with a couple of costs. Number one, in a rough year, uh, 2018 for Republicans was a rough year. 08-06. 08-06. In, in the 7-1 maps that I've seen, there were up to five districts that were vulnerable to being taken by Democrats. And so you go from a 7-1 in the best year to a realistically probably a 4-4 in the worst of years. Sandra McDowell being the example in 2018 lost four of the congressional districts in our current map. Um, and so you have to be mindful of that. I think you also have to be mindful of, and the one that, the thing that actually scares me the most is how we do initiative petition, being able for George Soros or any other left wing, you know, the, the national NEA to come in and put the, the progressive laundry list, the progressive wish list on the ballot and never have to collect a signature in rural Missouri. I think that's a problem, and that's what seven, a 7-1 seven map does. And so, from my perspective, the, the, the objective has always been the most solid, strong 6-2 map that's reflective of the values of Missourians and doesn't lead to those issues that we're talking about, doesn't lead to you know, a progressive takeover of the IP process any more than it already exists. I've seen those logs at Soulard Farmer's Market in St. Louis getting these signatures. That's right. Can you imagine an old boy going to Bunker and asking a guy right. that don't trust the government anyway to write his name on a piece of paper That's for right. the government, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> it ain't going mean, to happen. But it's, but it's real. I mean, if you, if, you, if you say you can get all your signatures in St. Louis, Kansas City, Columbia, and maybe go to, a little bit to Springfield for yeah. good measure, that's a real problem. So let me just, I mean, to me, I think the 7-1 thing is a, is a Facebook, Twitter thing. There's a lot of people that truly believe that. I think there's a fine argument for it. It seems like a little more conservative move to for sure get six than try to stretch for seven. Judgment call. Is this really about that or is this, I mean, I think, look, if you're from St. Charles County, you want your county together because you could probably elect a congressman the next time there's an opening from your county. Sure. Jefferson County wants that, Franklin, Butler County, Boone County. I mean, is it really just about wanting to make congressional districts better for some of the folks running in the open ones and maybe make it a better shot later for someone from their county yeah, to be there? I, I certainly think it is. It, like, and to the earlier point, everybody has some ambi ambition. That's okay. Um, the reality of our situation, though, is that um, St. Louis County, St. Charles County, Jackson County, three biggest in the state, they have to get split. It's, al it's almost an impossibility to do it in a way that doesn't jeopardize other things. Sure. Um, you also have the, the unlucky reality in this particular re re redistricting segment that um, the people who are, the, the area that, where all the change could happen is mm -hmm. St. Louis, St. Charles, Franklin County, Jefferson County. The speaker's from Jefferson County, the president of the Senate's from Franklin County, Two, two big parts of the redistricting debate are from St. Charles and the House floor leaders from St. Louis. You'll never have that unlucky reality wrong, again. Is though, without, with, with the speaker saying, I want my county together? No. That's, that's not negotiable. Well, and his, and his county's been split uh, in three for 10 sure. years, right? which I'm sure Jefferson County doesn't like. But my point is, I don't, I mean, we're both capitalists. What's wrong with people acting in their own self-interest? Yeah. At what point, how, how do you get past that, I guess? If everybody's operating in their own self-interest, they want what they want, how do you move on? Well, the assumption is, if. It, I'm fine with everybody acting in their own self-interest. At the end of the day, 
I know for a fact there are more than enough votes to pass 2117 the way that it is. And so from my perspective, oh, we could get 25. Yeah, n not, votes are not an issue. Clearly, we're trying to find a path to get to a vote. Um, so from my perspective and what I've said all along, pass a constitutional map, have 18 votes to pass a map and do something that reflects Missouri. And so I, I have something in front of me that does all of those things. And so we have a small number of people for whatever motivation anybody wants to prescribe to them that are standing in the way of that and standing in the way of progress for us to be able to go to the next thing. Well, I don't think privately someone would, would really do that. I mean, I should say, first of all, we're taping this Thursday afternoon. Yeah. You're gonna, we're watching, we're gonna watch this Sunday morning. A lot of things could happen. But I mean, to, and I, as I understand it, as people told me, there's been 6-2 maps presented by people who are out advocating for a 7-1 map. They've, ever, they've pushed some compromise, 6-2 sure. maps that, that, that favor their home areas. Yeah. Um, is that what happens behind the scenes? Because outside, you hear a lot of rhetoric that any 6-2 map is some kind of communist plot to take over the world. Yeah. But in caucus, folks are presenting 6-2 maps. That's right. There's, there, I think everybody who's advocated for a 6-2 map uh, has, has said behind closed doors that, that they'd be willing to, or advocated for 7-1, excuse me, in the right circumstances might vote for a 6-2. That's the dirty little secret of this whole thing. But you have to understand that anytime you make those changes, you're going to go someone else's there, ox, there, right? there's a domino effect. And, and in this particular instance, the dominoes are insanely complicated. And it's just not, it's not an easy uh, path like to find. If you target a guy in Cass County that may want to run for Congress, you might have allies of that guy. Then they pop up yeah. and have a problem. Yeah. If, you, if you strip Webster County because you may think somebody's stronger or not, then somebody else that yeah. is a fan of that guy, then they pop up. The moral of the story yeah. is this, this process is infinitely easier if Roy Blunt's running for re-election. <laughs> Give me this. Uh, what's some weaknesses of the map you have? If you, if you, uh, if you got to draw it in a vacuum, when people, when people give a critique, what's one that's harder to do? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest one is, is uh, trying to find the most palatable and the passable way to make CD2, from a Republican perspective, as strong as possible. So yeah. this map, 2117, makes it five points better by really by any metric. I've seen plus eight, uh, 538 says it's plus eight from where it is now. And the truth is, I think Ann Wagner's shown she she's going to take win. on a bear with a switch That's in the right. woods at Ann Wagner's going to win. Ann Wagner wins 2117 or any compromise for the yeah. next 10 years as long as she runs. You worry about. Um, you know, you worry about the, the trend, and then you also worry about who the candidate is. That's obviously, but that, that's the that's the one concern. Do you that wish I have. you'd have had your Senate Redistricting Committee hold some more hearings? My gut tells me you get here anyway. There's yeah. no way not to end up here, but might not have um, heard to bring that, that process a little earlier. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think maybe the only caveat would be, you know, th this had to be a at least initially had to be a narrowly tailored process because what we're finding, this was gonna happen regardless, right? Yeah. Because you're not gonna walk out of three meetings on the front end where everybody is happy. Sure. They're, they're just gonna know earlier that they were unhappy, right? And so then what, what is the response to that, right? So we, we it is a, it's a it was a, a tough reality. I know Mike, Senator Bernsketter worked uh, hand in hand with the House folks who were doing a lot of those public hearings and, and basically, I think the thing that's really important to understand is 2117 wasn't the first map that was drawn. Yeah. It was the product of every other map being drawn and recognizing that there are holes here, there are dominoes here, you make people mad here. And then 2117 was the byproduct of hundreds of other maps shown, being shown to not work. You're going to have constitutional questions, looks like where this could be headed. Um, if you don't pass a map, what do you think happens? You know, it depends on the timing. I, I, I worry about, uh, I mean, a lot of things could happen, frankly, and there's a lot, there are not you a lot of precedents. a federal lawsuit gets filed on the 22nd when filing starts. If you don't have a map done, probably a federal lawsuit's filed. Now, yeah. what happens with that? Yeah, you could make a claim that, that until we're out of session, even because the, the primary filing is a kind of an arbitrary, uh, you know, set of dates. The primary obviously is a real date um, and, and everything needs to be settled by then. I think you could make the case that as long as we're in session, the court could make the case that it's not right for them to take up because we're still here. We're still able and capable to do it. And filing is its own thing. You got to get it done by the primary. So it's- Do you wish you'd have done this in a special session, seeing where you are now? Um, you were going to get here yeah, anyway. Yeah, I mean, but... look, it, 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 it would have made it probably would have made certain things easier and certain things harder. That's the, there's always the trade-off in the Senate. Almost like a, almost like a congressional map. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let me ask you this. A lot of these issues began when you won a leadership race. Uh, some folks that came out on the other side of that formed their own conservative caucus. Let's look back in, in history. If you'd have lost a leadership race, so you formed the conservative caucus, mm -hmm. 
How would you have dealt uh, with Senator Hoskins this fully? Yeah, it's a, it's. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would hope. My, first of all, I would say I would never have started the caucus to begin with, um, uh, because. And I told, I've told, a number of guys within that that group, all of which, for the most part, I, I, get along with. We have our moments, right? Um, but, you know, the the thing that always can be problematic in politics is where. You start prescribing labels, and even more so than the label, it's the motivation behind the label, right? So, I'm I'm a, a, a rhino or whatever else, and that comes with a certain set of connotations. These guys are the only true conservatives, um, because you know even though they file um, gambling bills and tax credits and all these things that traditionally aren't conservative, it's, they've given themselves this name, and so you you immediately drive a wedge between yourselves and people that you agree with on 80% of the stuff. And, and if I am anything, I hope, I am capable of understanding that I'd rather, it's the Ronald Reagan thing, I'd rather be with somebody who's with me 80% of the time than not have any friends, right? And so, you know, if I'm in their position, I, my, my objective was always to get stuff done. So I'm never going to do something that doesn't allow me to walk away at the end of session and say, number one, I treated people with respect, but also number two, I accomplished some stuff. You right? could have been in here running for Congress. Matter of fact, most yeah. folks thought if you ran, you'd be the front runner. Do you regret not running? No, <laughs> not at all. How, what I mean, would this, this process look like if you were running for well, Congress? I'd be right miserable, now? and and it was. Could you have even done the job, really? Yeah, would you yeah. have to step aside? Yeah, I mean, it would have been tough, right? Yeah. And, and I do think it was the, the family was obviously the the, sure. the a one reason why we didn't do it. Um, but this was very high on the list because I we knew this was going to be an incredibly complex process, and so if you have at that point, we didn't know, you know, Dave, if he was in or out of the Senate race. But if you have all of those dynamics, um, and my dynamic added, it's it's almost impossible. And so, you know, part of it was coming into this thing with as unbiased of eyes as possible, and just saying, look, I just you got to get a map get done. To get we done. have to do our job, and we cannot embarrass the state of Missouri by the Missouri think, I mean, Senate. It's, not it's a funny thing, people, when the Senate doesn't pass things. That's what it's there for. Right. Pass everything. Yeah. This notion that should just instance, be rolling in, legislation through. In every through instance it, except this. It's yes, bizarre. I agree with that. <laughs> uh, but, but last point, you've said everything's on the table to pass this map. Do you mean every constitutional and every option inside the Senate rules is on the table to get this map done? Yeah, I do. Uh, and, and look, it's... Could the, you see asking Democrats to help you under the rules to move this forward? Yeah, I mean, I have. we haven't done that yet. Sure. Um, but it's very simple it's to me. It's happened in state history, but yeah, it, you haven't done it's that. It's very simple to me. The, the, there's going to be a majority and a minority on every issue, right? Um, and so the filibuster is designed to give the minority a voice. And, and in the Senate's case, a much, much louder voice maybe than is reflective of the number, right? Um, there is only one thing that we have that allows for the majority's voice to be heard in an instance where the filibuster goes on with, with no end in sight. And so, do I want to do that? No. Do I think that causes a, a tidal wave of, of problems as we move forward on the stuff mm -hmm. that certainly we all care more about? Absolutely. But the, 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 the rules of the Senate are, are very simple, and the rules don't dictate, you know, you can, you can, um, you can filibuster only against the other party, or you could PQ, like, that. It's, it's contextual. So I asked Caitlin about, I asked Senator Eichel last week about Caitlin's shoes, should I wear my more comfortable boots or, or my regular ones with a heel on on Monday <laughs> when, when people come to the Senate? Uh, I mean, I'm always an advocate for the comfy shoes, even if it's a short day. <laughs> well, it's so, safe. Yeah. Senator Brown, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. We'll be right back with our opinion maker panel. But first, go to showmissouri.com, the history of Cape Girardeau County. We had the presiding commission, we had Judge Stephen Limbaugh, had a great time discussing all things Cape and Southeast Missouri. ShowMissouri.com, this is Missouri One County at a time. We'll be right back after this. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. 
It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Your energy needs are changing. That's why at Ameren, Missouri, we're not waiting on the future. We're building it with the Smart Energy Plan, advancing thousands of projects across the state, helping reduce emissions through cleaner energy sources, boost reliability with self-healing equipment, and better withstand storms with new composite poles. Moving Missouri forward and bringing us all a little closer together. That's Energy at Work, Ameren, Missouri. Welcome back to the Missouri Politics from the State Capitol. A couple new guests for the show. Adam Sumner from Warrensburg, the host of the Heartland Pod. Welcome, for, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. You're like the resident veteran on the show now, Maggie Nuremberg. Yeah, I've Clay only Cabin. been on one time. This is my second time, but Ma thanks for having me Makes again. Make you the resident veteran. Bishop Davidson, uh, representative from the Springfield area. Thank you for making the time. Yeah, new and show. Doug Ritchie, Kansas City area. Thank you for making the show. You're the guy to talk to this week, right? Well, Big money spending going on in the Capitol this week, and you were kind of in charge in charge of part of making that happen. What did you buy with that federal money? Well, uh, Scott, as you well know, the supplemental budget is over $5 billion, and uh, much of that is the state employee uh, pay plan mm -hmm. that the governor uh, put in front of us. And then we also have uh, $2 billion, uh, close to that amount, for DESE, uh, for school districts and charters. And then beyond that, we have uh, Medicaid uh, dollars that are all in there. So Is that kind of the, the shortfall you had when they expanded it? Does that yes. help kind of plug that hole? Yes, yes, it does. And a school district, uh, I mean, I, I know like when the county's got COVID mitigation money, they didn't have anything to spend it on. So they kind of was able to put new windows in the courthouse or whatever. They got a little flexibility to spend that on what they want. Or yeah, it, so the feds drew that up uh, in a way that's pretty pretty broad in, in yeah. the purpose. I mean, they can't spend on I think at first they drew it they narrow, want. then they had to realize there's no way to spend this money on this, so they made it a little broader, right? Right, yeah. So districts do have quite a bit of latitude, but there is still a, a general topic that they're supposed to fit under. Yeah. Tell me, what, what could how could they have done a better job spending that money? Well, we could have done a better job if we got the money out the door months ago. And... You know, when we came into session on January 5th, we had that emergency supplemental right away. The governor um, the leadership had agreed to the emergency supplemental language. That's what we understood. And here we stand well over a month later. I just wish we would have gotten out the money out the door sooner because it was an emergency. I mean, that's the whole key to, to that title, right? Emergency supplemental, get the store out, get the money out the door quickly. We played games with it. That's why we're here today, just finally getting it over to the Senate. Tell me, uh, you know, seems like on the face of it, Washington sends you a bunch of money, mm -hmm. put it in schools and maybe uh, bump it up some state employees to keep them. Not a bad use of money. No, I mean, it's, I think it's really hard to argue with that as a use. And it's something, you know, folks who listen to our show know, I'm by no means am I somebody who's often agreeing with Governor Parson. And I find myself very much agreeing with Governor Parson on this one. Uh, I think he had a good idea and I think he, he, he put forward a good budget on that. And I'm somebody who owns a small business. I hire people, right? I know what it's cost right now to hire good folks. It costs more than 12 bucks an hour to hire folks. It just does. So it's good use. Mr. David, governor's a businessman. Figured, you know, you're not going to keep people if you don't raise the salary, right? Yeah, and, and honestly, uh, I, don't, I don't get the privilege or the curse of sitting on budget, <laughs> but I trusted a lot of the folks on there. I have a lot of trust in our, our budget chair as well. Um, and they, they make it easy on me so I don't have to go line by line and sure. I can know that their principle is being followed there. So well, I mean, generally, you're happy with how you got the, the money comes down, you're happy with how it went out the door? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, we, we had a tight timeline, and yeah. I, I was one that, that was saying early on we should have had a special session to move uh, mm -hmm. much of this money. Uh, we did, uh, I think, what we could have done, what we should have done, and, uh, you know, we did lose some time in January due to some weather and some illness in the building and things of that nature. So I, I would definitely say that no one was playing games with the supplemental. Well, COVID request. brought the money and COVID slowed it down, right? That's right. Let's talk about something no one agrees on. That's a, the congressional map. Sure. Um, the House moved theirs. It wasn't, wasn't easy. Didn't right. have a lot of folks to spare. Right. But they moved, the, they moved a map out that was generally six to two. And the Senate, it hit the dead wall of um, everybody wants to be a congressman. Yeah. You know, we've talked about it a lot on the pod. I've tweeted about it, and I do think I was here earlier talking to Senator Rowden, and one thing that I uh, 
he said was, you know, people are going to act in their own self-interest and maybe, and maybe that's okay. I disagree with that. I mean, we're, it's on the front of the building that we're sitting in right now, you know, Salus Populi, you know, Suprema Lex Exto, the welfare of the people, not selfish behavior. So I do think that that's important and the welfare of the people is get it done. You passed a 6-2. What was the argument that persuaded you to pass that map? I believe in protecting communities of interest, even if that community of interest does not vote the way that I want. I think that that is a conservative position to hold. I believe in our representative form of democracy. You spoke up for the folks in Ray County. I saw that. Uh, they, the first draft of this map, did not have them together. It had right. a bunch of issues. They, they came down here. Got it. I thought it was a real neat thing yes. of how government could work, is a bunch of the community comes down. And I saw you speak up for him. I, I thought that's that's kind of a neat thing of how things should work. Yeah, actually, I mean that, that shows a, a clear example of the fact that the voice of of community members does matter to the process. And I I commend the committee for listening to them and making the adjustment. I, I mean I, I think a, a six two is where we are today. A six two, mm -hmm. it makes sense that that's where we'd be tomorrow. Um, for me, when we're talking about how we win future elections, because. At the end of the day, I hope Missouri ends up being 8-0 in 2022, but I want it to be 8-0 because we mobilized more Republicans and we persuaded like more that. independents, and we went through the, the, the political process to prove that, hey, we, we've got a better platform and we've got something for the people of Missouri to stand behind. Uh, I, I like where we are right now. Uh, and with Doug, it will be interesting to see what comes over from the Senate. But I go back to, I mean, the people that came over from Ray County, this is no different than the St. Charles County. What did Ray County want? They wanted their county together. That's what St. Charles wants. Now, you, I don't know that Jesus is on a side here. I mean, it's just people want their county together so they can have the best chance to elect their own Congress and be represented. I don't see a sinister person here. I just see a bunch of people with own self-interest colliding. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's the system, right? Yeah. Uh, our system's designed to, to pit ambition against ambition, I think, as Madison put it. And, and we're seeing that here today. Hopefully, it doesn't come to a complete stop. That's the only question. Okay. What do you think? I have a lot of thoughts, and yep, they start me. with, let's let the women take back the Senate. And well, I say did, that so yeah. sincerely. It was amazing to watch them. I felt humbled and honored that they were serving our state in such a dignified manner. What if one of the women represent St. Charles County and one of their counties Okay, but let me say this piece. The women of the Senate have worked out a lot of tough deals. And I say that quite sincerely. I hope when we talk about the FRA, there's a lot of issues where these women have come together because women get things done. We do, we, we, it's not about us, it's about what's best for our state. At this point, I think the 6-2 map, you know, that has been, you know, whether you call it the shawl map, what, that's a good map. Um, would I like a 5-3 map? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's when we look at a 60-40, 60% 60 Republican, 40% Democratic. It's 5-3, it's more representative. When you know, Republicans say, hey, pretty soon we're going to be at a 7-1 or we're going to be at an 8-0. I don't see that happening. I see it going the other way. I like what he said, though, about if you get there, it should be by persuading people, not absolutely. manipulating it, people. It absolutely should, and that's why I have tremendous respect for what Representative Ritchie said. You don't have to agree, but you respect the process, and we have got to keep communities together. When I see these wagon wheels coming out of the, the center of Kansas City, I'm disgusted by what I see. I, I, I would say that sincerely. So I ask but that that's the, how you would elect Democrats. There's wagon wheel things out of the urban area. Well, that's the gerrymandering has been off. For, right? and, yeah. and that's the thing. I'm disgusted by what I see with the gerrymandering in other states, Scott. But other states aren't Missouri. And right now we are concerned with Missouri voters having a voice and having a fair voice in our elections. Let's talk about something you brought up to me earlier, education. There's a bunch of education bills. Give me your thoughts on them. Well, there's some really good stuff out there. And one of the things that I've said is that this tremendous interest in education is a good thing for our state. I commend uh, Representative Ritchie for a lot of what's in his parental bill of rights, a parent's bill of rights, a guardian's bill of rights. So good I know Senator Rizzo filed one. Senator Rizzo has a good one. <laughs> and here's the deal, Scott, that already happens in a lot of school districts. Desi has a parent's bill of rights. Most school districts do. do we, should we codify what's some of that? There? I think that's a good idea. What's in there? Yeah, it's basically a parent's uh, uh, freedom to be able to have access to information about their child that the school district has, to be able to have access to curriculum 
to have access to uh, other types of details and making decisions on behalf of their children that the school is involved with, their health, things of that nature. And, and uh, uh, Representative Nurnburn's right, in most of our school districts, what is in this bill and, and other bills like it uh, is already happening. The unfortunate reality is we have districts in the state that are ignoring the fact that we have to start at a baseline, and that is parents have a right, they have a responsibility for the care and the well-being of their children. So what I've told people about my bill in particular, and when we had the, the hearing, my why for a Parents' Bill of Rights bill with transparency language on there and a response to the critical race theory component is to reestablish trust. We all know trust has eroded significantly. Absolutely. And I was shocked when I saw what Representative Knight found. He found, you know, I've heard a lot of folks say the answer this is a charter school. He found some of the most wild left-wing Black Lives Matter activism at this charter school that was sponsored by Wash U in, in St. Louis, it was shocking. There had to be a little I told you so by Democrats that this may not be the answer you think it is. That's, I mean, the, the charter school thing is such a misnomer, and, and I, <laughs> the fact that the conversation has gone there I, is ridiculous because people want, if they want this control, they want to have this ability, you want to build trust. You build trust the way, you know, Scott and I have gone back and forth, and how do we build trust? We sat down, we had lunch, we, we shook hands. Anheuser Busch helps. What do you it think? Does, this yeah. bill's going to pass, right? A form of this bill passes. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's. A, I don't think the conversations gravitated towards charter schools necessarily. At the end of the day, I, I've said since the campaign trail, and it's maybe become more relevant now. I want to empower parents and enable teachers, and so all of my education votes are going to be oriented around how can we do those those two things. Prediction: Your bill, I think, passes the House. Correct. I mean, that's all. Yeah. That seems yeah. like a runaway trend. Exactly Pass the Senate. Yes. Could you go over there and make a case to a Democrat, this is good for this state and good for their folks, and, and, and meet the test of getting into the Senate? Yes, I mean, I our work on the, on the Joint Education Committee, yeah. uh, I, we've got relationships that are in place, and we have an understanding that there are things that have to be addressed. Everybody mentions your bill as the one that, that, if nothing else, if everything melts down after the Congress, around that, what do you think? It goes through? Yeah. It's on the governor's desk? With significant modifications. Do and I process work? Yeah, absolutely. Schools are already open to parents. What we can't do is put teachers in a position to where they can get punished for being teachers. Well, we're going to yep. get punished by getting kicked off the air. So who won the week? So uh, real answer, who won the week? I, I think it's got to be Nancy Pelosi. I hear she's got a lot of influence here in Missouri. Uh, and I mean, if she's got that much influence, I mean, I've been here for a couple of hours and I've got none and I haven't seen her at all. So okay. she's got to win. I'm going to start wearing dresses without a blazer on top and showing my confidence there. Okay, who won the week, the budget team? Here. Oh, I'm serious. We have been in so many hearings. We were here last night until 9 o'clock with ARPA. I have to give a lot of credit for our budget team members who really fought for those pay raises for our state workers. In the House today, we cut out nearly $8 million from our state workers' pay plan. Who in the week represent Richard? Amy Volpert, my LA. Wow. She works uh, for both myself and Representative Hudson, and we both uh, chair a couple of different committees, and she has been working um, uh, like crazy. She so didn't I, get the snow days, huh? She had no, to work them. That's yeah. right. Who won the week? Oh, no doubt, Brian Seitz. Of course he did. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think in honor of that who won the week, you won the week, uh. because that was the, the best one ever from last week. I put a, I'm going to say a couple St. Charles Countyans. Uh, Robert Cornejo, a person who served in this building for several years, is now going to be a judge in St. Charles County, and Tecla Spainhauer, long, her family has a long service in the history of the state. She left Senator Honor's office to be, do government relations. She served this state in several capacities in the very capital. I think those two St. Charles Countyans won the week. Hope you'll join us next week. You can win the week by watching us back in our St. Louis studios with Mayor Tashara Jones on This Week in Missouri Politics. This Week in Missouri Politics, sponsored by the Missouri Association of Career Fire Protection Districts, Spire, and Sterling Bank.